Welcome everybody to this event uh, on the German Seitenwende and its implications for um, British-German relations and uh, the strategic review. I'm very pleased to um, speak uh, to a, a virtual audience, which I hope will be uh, will be large, and, and hopefully we have reached across continents to attract a lot of people to what I think is a very very timely and important uh, topic. Not least because of the broader implications for European security and defense, and of course the crisis in Ukraine overshadows uh, everything. Now um, you will have heard. Um, some of the news around um, the, the speech that uh, the German, new German Chancellor Olaf Scholz uh, gave uh, a couple of days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where he used that term Zeitenwende to um, really make an argument of how German security and defense policy needs to change in uh, radical ways and the most visible expression of that change is that commitment to um, a hundred billion uh, euros uh, special fund, special purpose fund to support uh, German uh, defense procurement, to support the German armed forces, a commitment to spend 2% of GDP, i.e. the NATO um, target uh, for the next coming years on uh, defense. And to break with some of the taboos, uh, certainly around providing uh, weapons uh, to Ukraine. Now, after that landmark speech, um, some of the things that have happened since have cast perhaps some doubts over uh, the seriousness of that Zeitenwende, uh, not just beyond the money, but in, in the heads. So the Zeitenwende in den Köpfen uh, and, and how serious um, that commitment has been. Now, there are lots of questions that arise from this significant shift in German uh, defense policy, uh, perhaps the potential, potential shift beyond the issue of spending. And I hope we can elucidate um, some of these um, implications, um, particularly for uh, British-German relations in the coming hour or so. And we've got fantastic speakers that can help us to make sense of uh, these, um, these changes. Uh, first of all, I'll uh, just introduce um, the speakers um, one after the other, um, starting with uh, Dr. Helena von Bismarck, who's currently a visiting research fellow at the Center for British Politics and Government at King's College London, as well as a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. She has lectured on Western European history at Humboldt University to Berlin, where she also completed a PhD in modern history. Her first book, Conceptions of Informal Empire, British Policy in the Persian Gulf, 1961 to 68, was published in 2013, while her current book project will explore the relationship between Margaret Thatcher and Jack Delors. Next is Gesine Weber, who is a research analyst at the Paris office of the German Marshall Fund of the US, and a PhD candidate at the Defense Studies Department at King's College London where her research interests include the EU's common security and defense policy, EU-UK security cooperation after Brexit, and the E3, which you all know is France, UK, and Germany, and their respective security policy. She has previously received an MA in European Affairs with a distinction from Sciences Po Paris and an MA in political science from Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, last but not least is Dr. Eileen Matley. Uh, she's a, a research fellow on the security and defense program at the German Council on Foreign Relations, DGAP, and was previously deputy head of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung's Israel office in Jerusalem. An alumnus of the War Studies Department, she earned her PhD on the impact of US engagement with NATO during the Obama presidency from Martin Luther from the Martin, Lu Martin Luther Universität Halle-Wittenberg, where she was a research associate for the chair of international relations and European politics. Um, I should have said, my name is Christoph Meyer. I'm a professor of European international politics at the Department of European International Studies um, at King's College London. And of course, I've, I've done also a lot of research on European foreign policy and, and, and um, there's a, a book coming on uh, European foreign policy in an era of surprise. Um, which we submitted before Ukraine, but I think there are still re relevant lessons uh, because we are looking at the 2014 Ukraine crisis. So hopefully we'll have a good discussion. Every speaker has, I think, around 10 minutes um, for um, comments, eight to 10 minutes. And then I would really welcome any, co any questions in the chat and I will read out 
uh, the questions. Um, I'm not sure whether you can rate them, but if you can rate questions you really like, then I will. Uh, that will increase the chances of me posing them. So, in the order I've just uh, started, I would like to invite Helene to to um, hit, off, hit us off, please. Well, thank you very much, Christopher, for the introduction and uh, to the Center for Grand Strategy. Thank you for having me. I've attended the other two sessions on the Integrated Review in celebration of its first birthday in recent weeks. And uh, from what I gather, the point of tonight is to establish how post-Integrated Review Britain, post-Brexit Britain, should deal with Germany or can deal with Germany, particularly in times of Seitenwender. Seitenwender is a German word which means much more than turning point, it means watershed moment. And um, uh, we need to discuss this in the context of the significant increase in defense spending precipitated by the Russian attack against Ukraine. Um, there has been a lot of talk uh, recently about the question whether Seitenwender uh, is even taking place, if it's even a thing anymore. Um, as a historian, I would say that the jury is still out and that it is far, far too early uh, to say. In fact, looking at other watershed moments, both in British and in German history, such as the Suez crisis or indeed the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, uh, will probably need years uh, to establish how much has changed. I would also point out that it is not uh, these watershed moments um, in hindsight, very often they turn out not so much as moments where everything changed, but moments of truth, moments where long term problems or grievances or developments just come, become impossible to overlook. So uh, a, a big crisis focuses minds and makes us look at the world in a different way. And that in itself precipitates change, or at least it can. And we have to see what happens in Germany. Um, so rather than giving you a de definitive judgment uh, whether or not certain vendor has taken place, what I'd like to do is give you uh, a few things to look for um, in the months and indeed years to come that will, in my view, determine that question. Uh, the debate about Germany's Titan vendor is, in my view, very often conducted much in a much too narrow way. Um, we need to talk about much more than just the increase in defense spending and also about much more than the question how we're going to spend that money, although both of these things are very important and significant. But I would like to, and I'll leave this to Eileen and Gesine, who actually know much more about this than I do, I think, but I want to talk about three other things determining really the relevance of this site and vendor. First, we need to talk about the way in which political in elites and indeed German society at large talk and even think about war in general, about questions of war and peace, about the military and about foreign policy. And I think that the Russian invasion has had a very profound impact on this. I think there has been a change and I don't think it will change back anytime soon. Germany's long standing pacifism for which there is there are very sound historic reasons and the very widespread discomfort with all things to do with the military that has been really shaken to its core by what's been happening in Ukraine. Um, this debate about how Germany approaches the question of um, you know, being at war or dealing with a war in Europe, because we're obviously not at war, um, this is a debate which will take time. And I can fully understand how this is very frustrating from a Ukrainian point of view, because they don't have time. Um, but still, that dis debate is very much happening. It's everywhere. It's in every newspaper. It's in every talk show. And um, a really not insignificant number of sacred cows have been slaughtered over the last three months. The political party where this is most perceptible are the Greens, um, but it's not at all limited to them. So if I would look at this question, uh, the way Germany looks at war in general, I think there has been a Titan vendor or at least there has, this has been a turning point. The second thing we need to look at to determine the relevance of uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine on Germany's um, defense and foreign policy is um, the relationship between, in Germany, between supposedly unpolitical business elites and long-term geopolitical developments. Or to put it much more plainly, we need to talk about the way in which Germans look at a map. Germany's Russia policy of at least the last 15 years really is a prime example of a failure to recognize that for a country of Germany's size and economic power, 
um, and also for an exporting country like ours, there is no such thing as an unpolitical business decision. Uh, and we see that in our um, dependence on Russian energy. In fact, uh, a few days ago, Angela Merkel did her first uh, interview since leaving office. And what struck me most about the interview wasn't anything she said. It was the fact that the journalist didn't even ask her how her government could allow uh, the development of Germany's uh, dependence on Russian energy, because that's a problem which built up over at least a decade. The fact that he wouldn't even ask that speaks volumes, in my view, about sort of the wide gap, the chasm we have in Germany between talk about business and talk about foreign policy. We have a very influential business elite, which pretends that um, they're not doing anything political when in fact, of course, it has political consequences. And in my view, this needs to change. And I think there has been a change. This is being recognized now, our, our energy policy and change is changing and it won't change, change back. And also there has been a debate about what the example of Russia and Ukraine means for our relationship with China. And in the long run, this will be important. That said, um, I expect the backlash from a not insignificant part of the business elite to be substantial, in fact, is already happening. So here the jury really is still out how much of a change we will see in sort of the development of even such a thing as strategic and geopolitical thinking um, in sort of Germany's political and business elite circles. And thirdly, to determine whether Titan Avenda is really happening, we need to talk about leadership, and that means we need to talk about Olaf Scholz. Um, there are, in my view, three weaknesses or three problems with his leadership in this moment. The first is we, I am, he is just not very good at messaging or communicating his policies. Uh, indeed, there has been a pattern for the last three months of over-promising and under-delivering, and it's turning into a little, uh, into a real problem because it has called into question Germany's very reliability as a security partner. And it has also led to speculation of what he actually wants and what his aims actually are. I think uh, some of the speculation may be unfair, but his messaging should address it. And there is, um, shall we say, room for improvement in that department. The second problem, and I think it's actually a much larger one, is that um, the Chancellor does not, is in my view, not mindful enough um, of the role pace and timing play in times of war. Um, everything we do about Ukraine is basically too slow. That applies to sanctions, it applies to our policy in the EU, and uh, above all, to weapon deliveries. Um, and uh, it is really time and, and pace which turns a decision into a strategy, and he doesn't seem to realize that, or if he does, um, he doesn't act on it. And then thirdly, the third weakness in German leadership that we're currently seeing is, in my view, a focus, almost excessive focus on the big picture of our long-term relationship with Russia. Um, and while this is obviously a perfectly legitimate and actually very important topic, um, you can't really dis uh, discuss it if at the same time you fail to recognize that our long-term relationship with Russia will of course be impacted by the short-term development of the war in Ukraine. So again, time is of the essence. And that, th that um, failure to, to connect the short term and the long term, and also to maybe accept pain in the short term or problems in the short term, because you're thinking of the long term, that is the opposite of strategic thinking. In fact, I would call it intellectual escapism. So um, enough about Germany. What does all of this mean for UK-German relations? I think to establish that, we first need to acknowledge that Britain is currently right in the middle of a Zeitenwende of its own, albeit one of their own volition, and that Zeitenwende is Brexit. Brexit is a geopolitical turning point, and we don't talk about this enough, because it is about much more than just leaving an organization. It is about much more than leaving a market, and in terms of foreign and security policy, it is about much more than... Um, uh, just leaving the Euro European Union's common foreign and security policy. If we want to talk about Britain's grand strategy and Britain's long-term future in the world, we need to include the development of Britain's economy, its state capability, and the state of its alliances in the conversation, because all of these things are deeply affected by Brexit. 
So UK-German relations, in including security relations in 2022, really need to be looked at in the framework of a double Zeitenwende, the Zeitenwende of Brexit and the Zeitenwende of Russia's brutal and illegal invasion of Ukraine. There is a pretty significant overlap, in my view, in Britain's and Germany's international interests and also even policies. The war in Ukraine has radically changed Germany's threat perception. It has also vindicated the British point of view, um, which was also put forward in the integrated review um, regarding the danger emanating from Russia. Um, it has also returned the European continent to the center of British political debate debate after several years of focusing on global Britain. Now, since I know that there are people from the security um, community are listening to this, I know exactly what you're going to say. We were always committed to European defense. You people just couldn't see it. That's true. It is in the integrated review um, that Britain is primarily a Euro-Atlantic power. But if you don't mind my saying so, the government hasn't exactly advertised that fact until the war in Ukraine started. So there has been a complete shift in messaging and in focus of what sort of matters and the uh, all the existing problems with EU-UK relations notwithstanding, there has, in my view, been a real change in the way the British talk about Europe in the last three, uh, three months. Um, so that's good, um, in my view, talking about sort of collaboration. Um, there is also a considerable overlap between um, uh, but, uh, when it comes to the institutions where Anglo-German um, collaboration takes place, particularly in NATO. Um, I'll cut this short because I'm already over time, but I need finally to say a few words on mutual perceptions. This matters because perceptions define relationships. The Brexit policy of the current British government and the Ukraine policy of the current German government have sadly reinforced some of the most crushing prejudices and stereotypes about both countries. Um, I recently had a chat with the British colleagues and we were sort of as a joke, but we were um, um, uh, talking about stereotypes and prejudices. I quote, Germans are cynical peaceniks who are happy for others to do their dirty work in security while they do business with anyone. Worse, they then lecture you on morality and not to be outdone. Speaking about the British, I quote, the British are self-obsessed narcissists who refuse to see that they are not a world power anymore. Well, I'm aware that both of these quotes are brutal, but not only would I argue that they contain more than a grain of truth, but I've also very often heard variations of both of them in both capitals in recent years. In fact, if there is at the moment one thing the British and the German government have in common, and not just the government, but also parts of their foreign policy making elites, that um, there is a chasm that exists between the way in which they see themselves and the way they're being perceived abroad, not everywhere abroad, but certainly in the other country respectively, when we talk about the relationship. The consequences of this failure to see ourselves as others see us and to address this gap can be profound because it can, and in fact, it already has made both Germany's and Britain's allies question the very things that our countries supposedly stand for in the world. In the British case, that's the rule of law. And in the German case, and this is actually quite devastating for a German like myself to face up to, it is the commitment to the principle of never again. Fantastic. Thank you very much for kicking us off <clears throat> in such a lively and stimulating way. I mean, uh, lots of thoughts I, I, I might have um, about um, the, the fate of big countries and, and how they are sometimes insular and not, not, not learning. And of course, you also made an interesting reference to the fact that, um, well, um, the, the, that, that the relationship between the UK and uh, the EU, of course, currently is still very much in question. We are doing this one this talk on the day that um, the government has published its draft um, amendment to the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, and uh, that, that will no doubt spark further discussion. But um, I will leave it there for, this, for the moment and uh, encourage again uh, everyone to leave questions in the q and I think we have already a first one, but we are not going to do the Q&A yet. We are uh, still uh, looking forward to two more contributions to the debate. And uh, the next one uh, comes from, now let me just, it's, I think the next one in our order 
was uh, Gesine. So Gesine, uh, Gesine, please um, take 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 the next step for us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Christoph, and also from the uh, to the center for having me um, here today. Um, in fact, I want to pick up um, the last point that Helene mentioned, which was perceptions, um, because I'm going to widen um, our, our perspective a bit here. You see that in my background, um, I'm doing a lot of research on the EU, and that's also why I'm going to um, quickly elaborate on how the Zeitenwende was basically perceived in other European countries, and then um, open this up, this up to um, German-British cooperation in post-Brexit Europe, because we always, well, when thinking about bilateral relations, we always have to see them in the framework of um, the fact that Germany is still an EU member state. And um, this is an important atten um, addition to this debate. So maybe quickly on the, um, on how the Zeitenwende was perceived in other European states, I would say that there were basically two aspects of Zeitenwende that have to be taken into account here. On the one hand, this is, um, of course, um, as you mentioned in your introduction, Christoph, the announcement of this special fund of um, stepping up the capabilities um, of the German armed forces. And on the other hand, that is also the action that is supposed to follow this um, announcement and particularly the immediate um, action in the case of Ukraine. And um, it is, um, in terms of reactions from the European partners, in my opinion, it is very important to separate the two of them first to then merge them again, because the announcement of Zeitenwende really um, sparked, I would say, reactions from cautious to very euphoric optimism, sometimes also concerns, but this idea that Germany would step up its military with 100 billion euros, that was perceived as something that is significantly moving. And um, I'm based in Paris. So um, here in Paris, it was um, something that was absolutely not anticipated for any time to happen. And um, what was interesting in this regard was um, that on the one hand, it was of course welcomed by the policymaking community um, in France, but I think also in other European countries, but particularly in France, there was, however, a bit um, the reflection of concurrence between uh, France and Germany and what this announcement of stepping up um, defense and kind of really leveling up if everything was invested as um, planned, how this leveling up would affect leadership in Europe. Because when we're talking about Zeitenwende, we're not only talking about Germany investing just to put it bluntly lots of money in its uh, army it's also about um, being among the top five countries worldwide in terms of uh, defense investments and it would also be um, having by far the largest budget among EU member states um, to be spent on military and this would um, in, in the current European setup significantly alter the power dynamics, given that Germany is now already um, the biggest economic player and France is actually the biggest military player. But as I said, if these investments were maybe were really made as planned and also underpinned by policy, this would make Germany potentially a leader in both fields over the long term. And this for some European states might become problematic given that German leadership has not always been in contest, uh, uncontested in the in European Union. So that is um, on the Zeitenwende as such, but overall, particularly also in the EU institutions, it was of course welcome because um, you might also know that um, the strategic compass has been adopted in late March. This is a kind of guiding document for the EU, uh, EU security and defense policy over the next about 10 years. And um, this, this document contains a lot of information on procurement, on joint development um, of um, defense capacity, capabilities. And the fact that Germany would invest so much money in defense and make it available for procurement was very well received, particularly in Brussels, because there is the potential of really creating 
good new projects together. So this is the announcement. How does practice look like? The thing is that many basically expected German policy to change from one day to another, or at least that um, there was among Europeans the expectation that while Scholz had been quite hesitant, or um, yeah, you could also say too little too late um, since the beginning of the crisis, um, there was hope that this announcement would be underpinned by policy and that it might lead to a new form of German leadership. But this has not really been the case, or not been the case. Let's delete the really from this sentence. So um, the perception now is basically that this cautious optimism from the beginning um, that we saw on the announcement is rather shifting into sober realism, or one could even say um, frustration, because um, the fact is that given also that the German political system is very complex and that there are many veto players also when it comes to the concrete investments, um, it's complex for other Europeans to understand how, who will be taking which decision when, what exactly is the role of German domestic politics. And that in fact is a major source of uncertainty um, because it's still the German parliament that will um, have to vote, for instance, when it really comes to the investments as every investment of more than 25 million, not billion, has to go through the parliament when it's um, as far as arms or weapons are concerned. And um, this sparks concerns in other member states and also the fact that the German posi position on Ukraine is so little um, defined and that there is so little leadership. Um, this is sparking major frustrations. So the Zeitenwende announcement as such in European countries um, has at best a mixed perception at the moment. Um, from this, I want to skip to this question on how this mixed perception and the fact of whether Zeitenwende can actually be translated into politics or into policies that have a positive impact on the European project can benefit the UK or how the UK can fit into that. Um, I would say it should definitely not be seen as competition because we have already, um, or the first defense investments that have been announced by Germany, for instance, and in capabilities have been the so-called F-35. That's a fighter jet coming from the US, bought for, off the shelf. Um, and this has been a system that has been also bought by other states. It's, um, and there will, will most likely not be um, a concurrence. Or I don't see concurrence evolving between Germany and the UK. First, because they are, even though their interests might be similar, as Helena outlined, the strategic doctrines and also the fact how their military has intervened abroad is very different. And I don't see the German army transforming into um, an army which is leading more combat missions abroad, at least not on the short term. So I don't think that there is any kind of competition in it. Um, when it comes, I mean, again, it's about leadership as well, but here the leadership question is more about leadership in the EU, and then it's more about leadership between France and Germany, or potentially as also other European countries. But I don't really see um, competition in terms of leadership also in institutions, um, given that also the UK has a very special relationship with the US. And on the other hand, Germany is the US first interlocutor among the EU states. I see that as rather complementary within NATO than um, as a pattern of competition. Um, when talking about cooperation, um, I think I would have answered this question a bit differently one week ago. Um, the draft amendment that we see on the Northern Ireland Protocol, of course, changes this because the fact that the UK is ready to override um, the protocol and um, is just a significant breach of trust in the eyes of many Europeans. And given that the EU has proven a significant cohesion throughout the entire process of Brexit, I don't see a bilateral project um, coming out of the blue um, that would kind of undermine a common EU stance. And furthermore, we see also in the French-German relationship 
how difficult joint armament projects basically are. Um, France and Germany are um, de jointly developing a, um, a future combat air system, the so-called FCAS, um, which is an endless hassle. Um, it's super complicated to get the industries on board to agree among governments. And I don't see a similar project happen between Germany and the UK anytime soon, because um, the strategic compass and also Germany's membership in the EU um, will most likely rather motivate Germany to pursue this kind of projects within the EU. Um, however, I would say that the fact that Germany might invest this into the EU projects, and now I'm getting a bit technical, um, can in fact be a window of opportunity for the UK if there is, or maybe I should say, if there was political will. Um, the fact, um, there are many EU defense initiatives, for example, the PESCO, Permanent Structured Cooperation, the European Defense Fund, now there is a new hub for European defense innovation. And when a lot of German budget is flowing into these initiatives, this might fuel these projects. And for instance, the permanent structured cooperation is open for members uh, for states that are not EU member states. So in theory, there could be potential for cooperation. But in practice, I see what is happening with the Northern Ireland Protocol, and I don't see it. So in my opinion, the only format to pursue any kind of EU, UK or Germany, UK cooperation is in form of informal formats that have worked well, such as the E3 um, format between France, Germany and the UK on Iran, or um, potentially also replicate this format in other crises. And I see the white card from Christoph, which perfectly matches the end of my remarks here. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much for um, broadening our view to um, highlight the connections to the broader European context, to the strategic compass, to, to European security and defense policy. Um, I must say this is still something that uh, in the UK debate is uh, largely ignored. I went to this big conference on the defense of Europe and I think strategic autonomy and strategic compass were just mentioned in passing over six hours as a some sort of a silly little project of the French. But uh, I, think, I think that is vastly underestimating the significance, certainly in the long term of, of that. Maybe we'll come back to to that and thank you again for 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 um uh, placing that in, in in that context and giving us some some hints also to where maybe opportunities for collaborations uh, uh may lie between uh, the uk and germany and, and and the eu in this realm so um questions are coming that's good i can see them coming in the in the in the q a uh, section but again we'll have a, a one last uh, but not least speaker um, to 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 listen to and learn from, and that's uh, Eileen. So your ten minutes start now. Welcome. Many thanks, also from my side, from for the invitation and good evening. I will try to to add something to um, our discussion by zooming in on the German um, perspective. So as we've already heard now and already know. Uh, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, announced a Zeitenwende, or translated into English, sea change or watershed, watershed moment in German security and defense policy. To be more precise, when really looking at the speech, again, he used the term Zeitenwende in reference to the Russian invasion and its consequences for Euro-Atlantic security and the architecture of European security, not so, but not so much in direct relation to Germany's security and defense, however. That's rather what commentators, at least think tankers and journalists in Germany, but also um, abroad in Europe, read into the speech instead. As we've already heard and know as well, the um, speech included the announcement, among other things, of the establishment of a special fund for the armed forces, the Bundeswehr, worth up to 100 billion euros, arms deliveries to Ukraine, and the promise to finally reach and even exceed NATO's 2% goal from now on out. Now, three months later, three months after the speech has been delivered, 
parts of the announcements were put into practice or are in sort of in the process of being put into practice. The German parliament, the Bundestag, passed the leg legislation in support of the 100 billion euro special fund for the German armed forces, which necessitates a change of the German constitution in order to bypass a so-called debt break. Last Friday, the second chamber, uh, chamber of legislation, the Bundesrat, followed suit and approved the law too. According to the acquisitions acquisition plans put together and presented by Germany's defense ministry, most of the 100 billion euros will be spent on air capabilities supporting the Air Force, Army and Navy. And Gesine mentioned it already. One example of that comes in the form of the announcement to the acquisition um, to acquire the F-35 fighter jet to replace the Tornado fighter jet. That is an important, important announcement and decision in my mind because it emphasizes Germany's commitment to NATO's nuclear sharing arrangement and uh, which Germany has been part of for over 60 years now. In addition, a hefty sum, about 20 million, is allocated to the modernization of communications equipment, which has been aging for many years now um, as well. There are many more pro procurement projects that are part of the procurement plan, which I won't go into detail. At, um, at this moment, we can talk about that later um, if you want to. Instead, I would rather raise and address the question, does all of that and many more things that have been subsidized or that have been put under the label Zeitenwende actually add up to and Zeitenwende? Zeitenwende wholeheartedly supported by the government and at least Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz. I fear not, and here's why. In relation to Ukraine, as has already been alluded to, the military support is too little and possibly, and in some cases, too late with regards to the arms deliveries. Plus, and that also has been touched upon by Helena already, the communication and decision-making is quite cumbersome at times and difficult to comprehend, even for someone like myself, who's working on, um, on those topics on a daily basis. Now, in relation to Germany's security and defense policies, I would argue that money obviously is important for acquiring capabilities, but money alone won't fix anything. What do I mean by that? And what needs to be done instead and in addition? Firstly, equipping the armed forces is direly necessary, but most certainly needs to go hand in hand with a modernization of the procurement system in Germany and a necessary change of bureaucratic structures in order to avoid wasting money on a large scale as has happened in the past time and again. Secondly, the, uh, the establishment of a strategic culture to allow for more and deeper discussion, discussions on Germany's place in in the world and in Europe has to be instigated. Such a culture can be defined as, I quote, a number of shared beliefs, norms, and ideas within a given society that generates specific ex expectations about the respective community's preferences and actions in security and defense poli policy, end of quote. Translated into practice, that could mean fostering more acceptance in the public sphere for the need of security and defense policies on part of politicians without, however, dictating the terms and or outcomes of those discussions. It could also mean allowing and instigating an exchange with all types of stakeholders that are working on security and defense, including think tankers and political foundations, among others. Without wanting to sound cynical in light of the horror we're um, witnessing in Ukraine, I do think that the current situation really does offer a window of opportunity to sort of to instigate and lay the groundwork for, for such a culture, or at least the, the, sort of the establishment of such a culture, give the attention that the media um, places on the war against a country in the midst of Europe. In the past, in Germany, 
the public at large has not been much interested in security and defense policies, which in my mind is also down to politicians not really touching those topics publicly. Yet, currently, we see poll numbers that suggest a different attitude. Um, and I just want to give you a few examples from the very recent past. The majority of Germans, 52%, are in favor of US nuclear weapons being stationed on German soil, which indicates, in my assessment, a huge step forward and makes a strong argument for the continuation of Germany's role in NATO's nuclear sharing arrangement. About two thirds of the population are in favor of the special fund for the Bundeswehr. However, I would like to add that there are huge rifts within the population, most notably a strong east-west divide in Germany. Another example, in the beginning of the Russian um, invasion of Ukraine, a majority of Germans uh, was in favor of weapons deliveries to Ukraine. Although we have seen a public split, split on so-called heavy um, weaponry ever since Germany decided to, or well, at least announced, to provide heavy um, weapons to um, Ukraine. And then lastly, as another example, while the majority of the population is worried about Germany being tracked into the war in Ukraine, they don't think that the government should thus conclude to halt its support of Ukraine. On a very final note, and to sort of wrap up my, my quick um, remarks, to better capture and frame the current window of opportunity, which I think we are witnessing and seeing at the moment, the work on Germany's first ever national security set strategy that, that is currently underway and is supposed to be published in the beginning of next year should also include an extensive outreach with the broader public, which as far as I'm concerned, is in planning on part of the foreign office. And not only expert um, communities should be included in, um, in that process, thereby combining a, a sort, sort of bottom up and top down communication and exchange approach. In addition, allies, including Great Britain, ought to be closely involved in that process in order to ensure a streamlining of European meaning EU, but also, and I'd argue in some respects more importantly, a Euro, um, Euro Atlantic priorities, uh, meaning NATO, which obviously um, Great Britain is still a member state of. I will leave it at that. Um, thanks for your attention, and I look very much forward to your questions and the ensuing discussion. Thank you very much uh, for being uh, for these um, uh, interesting uh, informa bits of information around the defense spending, all the things that Germany still needs to do. Um, also mentioning the security strategy, which I think again will be, I think a, could be a landmark document, particularly if it is then um, supported and widely debated in, in, in not just amongst expert circles, but wider um, uh, German public. So um, thank you very much for <clears throat> giving us that perspective. And I think it all these di different pieces of the jigsaw fit together very, very nicely. So thank you. Thank you for that. Now, um, we do have some some questions in in the chat already and, and maybe um, I will just go through to, to some of the questions um, straight away. I do have um, some remarks and questions uh, of my uh, of my own, uh, which I might use my privilege to ask them. But let us just start with the questions. Um, I should also say that those who are posting in the question and answer section, it might be useful if you were able to say to who whom the question is addressed. So that might make it a little bit easier to um, uh, address it to the different panelists. I think one um, question that comes up um, is um, from, um, from I, I think I'll just pick one from, 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 from Poland here, from Zbigniew 
Sechinsky, uh, who I think describes, um, I mean, I'm not going to read out the whole question, but I think he puts forward um, kind of a, a East European viewpoint as he describes it. And he says, um, what we can actually, what we can observe is actually a more invisible proof that the political and business elites of Germany and France are looking for sort of strategic partnership with Russia along the continental axis, turning EU and EU Russia into an independent global power at the cost of US and China. Uh, this setup has no room for sovereign nations between Berlin and Moscow. Um, so, so Germany and France are actually pretending support for Ukraine, looking for going back to the pre-war status or relations with Russia as soon as possible. So, so this is, I, I suppose, um, um, a bit of an uh, epitomizing some of the disappointment with uh, what happened uh, after the Zeitenwende talk uh, in in Central and Eastern Europe. So, one would. Um, uh, so, I think it. it as such, because I think it illustrates some of the disappointment, uh, maybe that's a question that uh, is worth addressing. So, so do you think that this is actually the case uh, for Germany, that there is um, uh, an inclination to just kind of go back to Russia as a cheap provider of energy and, and, and a kind of um, um, belittling or patronizing of um, countries in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, and of course, part, part of the neighborhood, um, the wider neighborhood, such as Ukraine, and, um, Georgia, and so forth. Do you think that is that is that is um, still the case, or do you think there is a Zeitenwende in the way in which Germany sees Russia, and in the way also Germany um, listens to um, Central and Eastern European countries? So I, I don't know who wants to um, engage with that kind of question. Um, um, if you want to put up your hand, then you can, you can, um, I don't know whether it's Eileen or, 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 yeah, Eileen, if you want to give it, give it a first try. I know Helena has also talked about this a little bit. Um, so maybe you have a view on that. Sure, I can, I can start. I don't think quite honestly that Germany is trying to return to, um, to a status quo ante. I think the and decisions that have been sort of put in place and have been uh, launched, especially with regards to, um, to Germany's energy dependency vis-a-vis -vis Russia, will not be overhauled. I think that really is a process that will not be, that will not be uh, changed by, by this government or by any future government. However, I do understand, viewed from a Polish perspective or a perspective of, you know, you know, the Baltic states, for example, that France or Germany, especially in tandem with France, seem to be a bit reluctant in wholeheartedly supporting Ukraine, especially with regards to weapons deliveries. However, when it comes to to, to one's own security arrangements, i.e. NATO and the protection of NATO allies, I think Germany really has stopped, stepped up its game. I mean, it's, it's been an evolution since 2014, to be quite frank, but even now since the beginning of this year and even more so, it's been accelerated since the 24th of February this year, Germany is trying really hard to demonstrate not only with words but also deeds to its eastern allies that that it's that it does take their worries seriously and it is trying to address them by ways of putting more boots on the ground for example Olaf Scholz just very recently announced in Lithuania that Germany is trying as the first of um, of now eight framework nations to sort of up the ante by by placing a brigade-sized battle group uh, to to Lithuania, and I know that sort of when looking at the technicalities of the arrangements, there's still really room for, for improvement, and there's still yeah a bit of sort of wiggling room how to actually how to actually um, put that into um, into practice. But in sort of in defense of of Germany, I'd say that with regards to its own NATO allies. Germany is trying to sort of learn from its past mistakes by sort of, as you said, I wouldn't say belittle, but at least not taking their worries too seriously. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Eileen. Uh, Helena has her hand up as well on that topic. Well, yes, I, I agree with Eileen, but I would like to ask about this question of perception that 
uh, goes to what I used to say, the way that we look at the map and especially the way at, uh, in which Germans look at a map of Eastern Europe. And I think it is entirely understand understandable why it would seem that way that we don't care and especially that we haven't cared in the last 20 years about the interests and threat perception really of smaller Eastern European countries. I think, um, and that's again where our history um, sort of comes into play. Um, this, our whole relationship to Russia is of course deeply influenced by um, the Second World War. And what we have seen for decades is the tendency to equate the Soviet Union with Russia, when they're in fact not at all the same. And when lots of the horrors, the horrors inflicted by Nazi Germany on the Soviet Union, a lot of this took place in Russia, but also a lot of it took place in Ukraine and also Belarus. And there has been now recently, this is in all the newspapers and people talk about this, but this is sort of in the, in the I mean, historians were aware, but this wasn't really, I think, uh, at the forefront of thinking uh, of politicians. And also, again, with the energy, I mean, the Baltic states and also other Eastern European states made their concern about Nord Stream, not just Nord Stream 2, but also Nord Stream 1, very clear. And uh, and we, again, just uh, pretended that those were business decisions. So we have failed them. So I understand. What I would say is that right now, um, I don't think that this is the French-German plan. I don't think there is a French-German plan. And I'm not at all sure there's a German strategy, really. Um, what I gather from sort of conversations with people in Berlin is a complete feeling of being completely overwhelmed with this crisis of really sort of 30 years of certainty and you might call it smugness, really crumbling around them, and are now trying to find their feet. And there again, what's really tragic as a historian for me to see is how um, the chancellor seems to be unable to sort of um, be mindful of how our history obviously defines um, how the world sees us. And uh, in times of crisis, everybody is being renationalized. And it's the job, I think, of governments to address this. You actually have to walk, walk the extra mile to make your position clear. Otherwise, you can't be surprised that people will think in this way. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Helena, for that. And, and of course, Germany, um, perhaps also a reminder to everyone else, is it, 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 you know, foreign policy is made in a different way in Germany compared to the UK, right? You have three parties, you have uh, ministries who have their own powers, um, uh, you have the, 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 the groups within the parliament. I mean, the, uh, there's, there's um, uh, someone called Mützenich, who's, uh, who's the head of the SPD fraction in the parliament, who is a pacifist and has blocked lots of uh, previous attempts uh, for German reality. Armament, and um, I, I think I think it's it's it may also be a case of Mr. Schultz uh, uh, looking over his shoulder and, and wondering what it is that he can get through his own party and, and some of the ranks within his, his own party. But um, let's let's leave it leave it at that. Um, <clears throat> and maybe briefly, uh, Gesine, on, on on that question because we have got a couple of other questions, particularly on defense spending and coordination and opportunities related to the defense spending that we need to get through. But yeah, Gesine, any 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 kind of comments on that uh, initial I promise, question? I promise I'll be quick. Just wanted to pick up uh, Helene's point whether there was a French-German plan. I'm not sure either whether there is. But I think the point is that this um, situation in Ukraine is basically showing us that the French-German engine, even when even if um, Scholz and Macron try to um, kind of relaunch it with their co trilateral call with Putin, basically. Basically, this situation shows that the French-German engine is not enough for Europe in times of crisis. So I think it's a good symbol that we now see that the two of them are traveling together with Draghi um, from Italy to um, Ukraine, but also that we need to think about other formats, like, for instance, the Weimar Triangle, which is French, France, Germany and Poland, or also um, broader groupings of coalitions of the willings within the European Union, or also with other willing and able states like the UK. Thank you very much uh, for, 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 for that brief brief um, answer to the question. Um, I would like to go to some of the questions on defense spending. And there's a question from Kevin and Ryan uh, in France. In the light of Brexit, to what degree, if any, will British defense contractors be able to help Germany spend their new military spending fund, spending funding? Or is it more likely that German, Germany will buy American or perhaps French? And I think that also relates a little bit perhaps to Brent's Nemeth question about um, uh, 
the UK should not see the increased defense spending as competition. Uh, do you see this as happening or is it, is it a danger in the future? So is it, I suppose in the background, there's, there's, there's a question over um, where will Germany's defense capabilities be in 10, 15 years in relation to France and Britain and whether that is seen as a, as a, as a threat or not. Um, so that's one, one big question. Um, the other is more in the short term over where is the German defense spending going and, and, and are there opportunities, what are the expectations of Britain in particular with regard to that spending? Is there a need perhaps also for um, coordinating in some ways um, to make sure that um, uh, you know, we are not overloading um, you know, industries and, and that the, the, the spending is done in the most efficient way, delivering capacities for Europe as a whole. But just, just maybe more narrowly in the short term on the issue of um, British defense contractors and the question of opportunity or, or risk related to that um, new uh, defense spending. Um, do you have any, any, any thoughts on that? Um, I see Gesine has her hands, hands up on that question. Yeah, I can kick us off. So, yeah. I mean, to be very realistic, that would have been much easier uh, without leaving the single market. That is really the brief, but very, yeah, that's very the brief answer to that. So, of course, uh, there might be some projects where British con um, defense contractors could potentially come in, but um, it's quite difficult when you're thinking about um, joint R&D, so research and development projects and so on, to bring um, industries that are not in the European single market on board, given that we already see how difficult it is if you do it with industries that are part of the um, European single market. Um, to come to this question of competition, um, the, the question is really how will the money be invested? So current estimates basically say that we need 65, mil, um, 65 uh, billion to basically close the capability gaps and to live up to the, to the expectations of allies and partners and to basically allow the German armed forces to perform the tasks that they are supposed to perform. And they, then we would technically still have around 35 billion left which might go into multinational projects. Although there would probably also be um, a preference either for buying European or for, um, which in my opinion would be very desirable, work on the European side of um, development of capabilities. I think one aspect of competition that the UK might need to be aware of on the short term, but that doesn't only affect the UK, but also other Europeans and overall other states that um, now decided to step up their capabilities. That is that um, in a moment where everyone decides to buy off the shelf, at one point the shelves will be empty. So um, there will be competition in the market in general in the defense market. And I think that is something where um, Germany and the UK with other Europeans and also the US should potentially also through NATO, really coordinate to make sure that we don't have a race uh, to the shelves, if you want to put it like that, which would particularly be to the detriment to um, less economically powerful states. Great, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for those um, evaluations of, of what, what the, the limits of opportunity for the UK are. And I should perhaps also mention briefly in this context that um, there has been a lot of comment on uh, uh, Finland and uh, Sweden joining um, or trying to join um, NATO and, and relatively little comment certainly in the UK about Denmark, uh, the, the Danish referendum uh, about rejoining CSTP, which really had a very overwhelmingly, uh, you know, I think 70% in favor, which is quite a, quite a watershed itself. So I think that should give a bit of pause to the UK as well. Why is it that Denmark felt the need to, um, to be part, part of those discussions and to, to benefit from, from what, um, what that kind of growing momentum gives. But uh, there are many other questions here. One is, um, I think, going on, uh, uh, starting from um, what Aaron Reyes has said, given that the UK and France both are strategic operational national security European powers, how will the E3 fit into NATO uh, and into the EU strategic compass? So there's the EU-NATO cooperation and the kind of E3 format. What is the potential 
um, for that. And 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 really, is is Germany? I think it also goes a little bit in the direction that that David has, has said. Is Germany becoming? Is modeling? Is Germany modeling its its um, role in security defense um, according to what kind of country? Is it modeling according to France, to the UK? Um, nothing, nothing of that sort, um, but some sort of unique German uh, a, a model of, of being a, a security and defense actor. So, so I think these, these two questions may, uh, may, may go together. So one is about how do the think different institutional settings fit together um, and how can we envisage Germany's strategic culture changing and, 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 and developing um, towards what kind of strategic culture? Um, if 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 indeed France or the UK are models, uh, any any thoughts on those uh, two questions um, by by Aaron and 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 David? Okay, we have again a Gesine and then Eileen. Feel like I'm talking a lot here, but I maybe pick the um, institutional settings and the E3. So yeah. in general, the E3 has rather proven uh, efficient as a diplomatic initiative so that is more like a security than a real defense uh, cooperation as we see it for instance with Iran and here negotiations have become a bit more complicated over the last weeks but I would say this is in general something that can work out. In general for the E3 a lot of work is being conducted behind the scenes so um, when we are not seeing big initiatives of Johnson, Scholz and Macron at the same time that doesn't mean that there is no cooperation. The cooperation between the three countries and also the consultation is extremely strong um, and has been also, and particularly since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. Um, personally, I don't really see a big diplomatic initiative um, of the three of them at the moment when it comes to Ukraine, um, just because um, particularly for other European states, that's an issue of legitimacy. Um, I would rather see, for instance, Poland or also Italy because of Mario Draghi, who's just very experienced, um, who could form kind of a core group here. And more broadly speaking, I don't see something like an E3 core emerge in NATO. Um, behind the scenes on, or among high-level high diplomats, absolutely. Um, as an institutionalized format, rather not, um, because the UK really has a has traditionally a preference for security and defense cooperation through NATO, and I rather see it sticking to this doctrine and to these preferences instead of trying out new formats, at least within NATO. Ad hoc coalitions, informal groupings can be an add-on on that. For instance, um, the UK has also supported um, the task force Takuba in the Sahel, not militarily, but um, politically. It is part of the European intervention initiative. So we see that it is still engaged and participating, but um, that happens quite a lot under the radar. And I think it's exactly about that, um, about informal cooperation under the radar that can be um, reconciled with the government's position on Brexit. Great, thank you very much, Kazina. Uh, Eileen, next, please. Sure, I'll pick up the strategic culture um, question since I've also raised a point in my remarks. According to, to most definitions of a strategic culture, those cultures are infused by a respective country's history. So naturally, Germany has a different history as opposed to France and um, Great Britain. And also its society, its population has a different, has developed due to, you know, historical, um, historical roots, a different attitude towards um, its military and also the use of lethal force. So I don't really see, and I don't think it's, it should be sort of, that's what we should be striving for that Germany builds its strategic culture based on the model of either France, Great Britain, or the United States. I think Germany has to find its own way and sort of muddle, muddle through and see where, where, it, you know, where it ends up. I think 
and you know if that would include a sort of back and forth and highly contested discussions i think that that would be uh, i would welcome that rather than sort of tabooing the military and talks and discussions on the use of the military altogether as we have seen in the past in my um, humble opinion so because in the end you know discussing and contesting whether and in which situations the military should be used as one part of germany's toolbox i think should uh, means that we you know we actually talk about um, security and defense instead of not talking about it at all and sort of engaging in navel gazing and only um, thinking about you know sort of other sort of domestic um, issues instead of realizing that we are while you know our neighbors are our friends and and allies there are at least in the form of Russia, there are countries um, that are not as benevol benevolent. And um, I think if we could sort of reach a stage where we at least talk about what war and peace um, could mean, and without always agreeing on, on what that means, but at least, you know, having a discussion on that, I think that would really be um, a very important step forward as compared to where we've been in the past. Thank you very much uh, for those views. I see Helena has uh, her, her, her hand up, and of course, it it, it partly relates to uh, what a historian a historian will, will will know. And everyone also knows, of course, that that every nation is every nation, and sometimes also each political party is using the history that best fits their their preferences and have have their own favorite favorite moment in history that teaches the lesson that they are most comfortable with. But um, I'm, I'm not going to say any more. Um, Helena, what, what what are your your views on, on on that kind of complex German strategic culture and where is it going? Well, I just wanted to build up on something which Eileen said and about more generally about the question of one emulating each other's examples and two the question of complementing uh, rather than each other um, in the wake of actually a joint threat, which is uh, sort of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I agree with Eileen, and I, I would even put it more generally that it's, in my view, pretty pointless, but actually pretty widespread for Germans to blame Britons to be so un-European. And that has a long history. And it's also pretty pointless for, for the British to blame Germany for being so, as I quoted, you know, cynical peaceniks and so forth. Um, because at the end of the day, I mean, if the basis of the relationship is that we expect each other to become more like us and um, we're really setting ourselves up for failure and instead we should maybe look at those differences and then look at the bigger picture and see how we can actually complement each other talking about ukraine i mean britain has had a pretty impressive record one on sort of identifying the scale of the threat pretty early on, Ben Wallace uh, especially, and, and then on delivering weapons and also supporting Ukraine diplomatically, Britain doesn't have a good record at all when it comes to taking in Ukrainian refugees. That is something what Germany excels on. So you can blame each other for not doing the right things. You could also say, look, this is for you domestically and culturally easier to do than for us. So, you know, this could be a collaboration rather than, you know, blaming each other for not being like us. Speaking about complementing each other, I would even take this further and talk about the relationship between EU and NATO a little bit, again, in the bigger picture of the war in Ukraine. I think what the Russian aggression against Ukraine really shows is how NATO and the EU actually have complementary roles to play in that conflict. Since Russia is a nuclear power, intervention is not an option. So all uh, non-military means as well as deterrence have, be, have to be used to, uh, to stop the Russians. And that's where the EU and the questions of sa sanctions uh, and also the aspirations of Ukraine to join the EU um, come in. And, um, as, uh, and then again, uh, the uh, sort of delusion that quite a few people in the EU, especially in Germany and also in France, have had um, over decades this idea that you only need the EU to uh, establish peace in Europe. That doesn't hold up. Um, we need NATO <laughs> very much. So we need both. And um, Britain now finds itself in the interesting um, and somewhat um, complicated position that if it takes the Russian threat very seriously and looks at things strategically about the future, about European security, then the EU 
should be part of Britain's grand strategy, even if Britain is no longer a member. Of course, this runs into political problems. I'm not saying that they should rejoin tomorrow and we do it together. I'd love that, but I know it won't happen. But what I'm saying is that there is now, I think, a recognition that um, at the time of the referendum, there were plenty of people who thought the EU was ridiculous and uh, redundant anyway. And that has just proven not to be the case, because otherwise, why would Denmark vote in for the joint um, common security policy? Why would uh, Ukraine be desperate to join it? So the EU matters. At the same time, NATO obviously matters hugely in this situation. So I think both in Germany and in the UK, we need some very sober thinking and long term thinking about how instead of, you know, hating each other for preferring one organization over the other, we should think about how we could sort of complement each other in the face of this threat. Great, thank you very much for, for your thoughts. And we are slowly running out of time, um, but I think maybe towards the end uh, to have one kind of last round of, of responses from, from all three of you, perhaps we can bring it back also a little bit more to, to Britain. And what is it that Britain should, should take away from, from these, these current um, developments? And what, what is it that we can, can learn from each other? I certainly think that um, one of the uh, benefits uh, of um, the, the, the British cultures is that the kind of learning, a learning culture, you know, after things have gone wrong, there are often inquiries, there are post-mortems, people look at what, what is it that one can learn uh, from these crises. And I think, I think one of the reasons that Britain was probably more proactive is that it learned from the 2014 crisis, where it also got everything wrong about, uh, about Russia, that it learned better than Germany did after 2014, where that learning was, was, was um, uh, uh, and, and not really uh, in-depth and independent. Um, but there's, there's a, a kind of a broader, um, I think, difficult question that always comes up now, and that is not... Um, uh, spoken about poli in, in polite circles, it, it's really the, the German, is this the return of the German problem? And it's the first question by Salomon. Um, should Britain be prepared to assume its historical role as an external balancer? Uh, because there's kind of new power competition between France and Germany potentially, and, and because Germany is getting too big again, right? And there was a bit of that also with regard to um, to France. I mean, there was, uh, I think, the remark that that maybe France is also slightly worried. But then again, I'm also thinking about Radek Sikorsky talking about fearing German weakness more than German strength. So there's, there's a, a dilemma around German leadership that on the one hand, there is call for more leadership and more, 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 more leadership, certainly of the kind that is wanted. But on the other hand, there are these big concerns over German might, over German power potential, and 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 that 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 does bring up these old historical questions over what is it that Britain should do, and how should it approach that Germany if it is changing its role away from just being focused on the bottom line and, and, and economics. So, so really some kind of takeaway points for, for, for Britain um, from, from all three of you. And maybe I'll start with Eileen um, and um, then go to, to Helena who has her hand up as well. And then Gesine last, thank you. Thanks, I think Helena raised her hand first, but sure, I, I'll, I'll say something and keep it very short and brief. I th thanks for, for raising that um, Sikorsky quote, which I think he said in 2011 and, um, and pointed out that what he, he feared more than German action was German inaction. And I think that neatly captures what our Eastern European allies still think um, of Germany. And really, it's, it's not a question of, of fearing Germany becoming too big, also milita in military terms. I think what what you know our allies um, in the east, but um, to some extent and to some respect in in my um, interpretation, at least also in in Western Europe and certainly across the pond in the United States, what they expect of Germany is more leadership, and also in terms of not military leadership, um, but rather sort of putting troops on the ground and really and really sort of uh, translating their their words into um, into deeds and it is thus thus my conclusion that germany i mean germany will always um, always act in in concert with its european and um, euro atlantic allies 
So what the only um, sort of thing that I would uh, that I, I would add in that regard is that Germany should always be mindful of, of trying to really um, consult with its allies, thus also the need for really cooperating closely on, on the formulation of the national security strategy to really make sure that all the priorities of, of all our allies are considered in that um, in that landmark or in you know a document that could become a landmark um, document. So um, in sum and in conclusion, I I really don't think that Britain um, should be afraid of Germany becoming um, too big, not least because uh, Germany and Britain are obviously all um, still NATO allies and are part of the so-called Quad in NATO, which is sort of informal grouping cons um, consisting of the UK and um, and Germany, among others, where close consultations on um, on you know on military and planning still take place. So yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. So um, going to Helena for some concluding concluding remarks. Either you know, I think you will you will not struggle to have a message towards uh, towards the UK. Um, uh, you already had some some remarks, but maybe you want to kind of wrap things up in a way that uh, everyone uh, will take away from this, uh, this meeting. Thank you. Well, I also agree with Eileen. I don't think that Britain should be afraid of uh, a Germany which um, takes a more realistic way at the world and sort of um, shed some of the, its delusions, uh, thinking that we are um, we are not doing anything with geopolitical consequences because we're just doing business. If we sort of look into the mirror and face up to what we are and what we can do, that's a good thing. And I think it's to be welcomed. But I would also say that at the moment, everybody might be crying for uh, German, German leadership. I fully expect that to, at least in some parts of the media, to change at some point. It is interesting that some of the loudest voices, especially in Britain during the Brexit referendum and afterwards, who complained about Germany's power within the EU, are now the ones calling for more German leadership. And there's a certain irony um, to that. Um, I think generally speaking about this uh, conflict, people have been saying that um, we're seeing the return of history. Um, well, I don't agree, it has never stopped, but what you're certainly seeing also in the way we think about this and how we debate this is we're seeing the return of geography because that our geography, all of our geographies all over Europe, it, it has a big part, it plays a big part in how we perceive this crisis. And obviously when you're in Estonia, uh, you're more more afraid of the Russians than uh, than when you're much further away. Um, so uh, I don't really have a concluding message. I don't think, by the way, this idea that Britain should resume its um, its a traditional role of a balancing power. I would actually question if that is an accurate uh, sort of summary of the centuries of Britain history. British history is actually a bit more complicated, in my view. Um, what I certainly think is that Britain is needs to think more, and it's already happening, think more about Europe, uh, think about the role it wants to play there, acknowledge its realities, even those it doesn't like, such as the EU, you don't have to rejoin, you don't have to like it, but you have to acknowledge its existence, sort of deal with it. Um, I think we're actually seeing that, we have been seeing this about uh, over the last three months, and we've had really pretty brutal reawakening, I think, both in Britain and Germany about sort of that uh, gravity is reasserting itself, and that I think is to be welcomed. Thank you very much. Reminds me of the saying geography is destiny, um, which is uh, which is interesting because, of course, at the same time, we have these global ripple effects of the Ukraine crisis with supply chains, um, food security issues being raised. So on the one hand, we have, of course, that that uh, uh, that the, the differences in threat perceptions according partly to geography as well as history. But on the other hand, we, we're seeing the globalization of, of that particular war in, in Ukraine and its consequences that have not everyone has, has thought through. But let's let's leave that to a side for the moment. And uh, Gesine has, I think, um, the opportunity for last, uh, last wrap up. Yeah, I mean, very quick, um, particularly, um, I think there is potential um, to enhance cooperation between the UK and Germany, particularly behind the scenes. I don't, as I already said, don't see a big political uh, declaration and particularly because for me, it seems that there is no appetite for that on either of the sides. And um, as simple as it sounds, for me, the most important takeaway for the UK is 
if you want to cooperate with either European country, you have to get Brexit right. And that hurts. And as Elin said, that's a message that the UK doesn't like. And also in the beginning of, or when the war in Ukraine basically started, even before that we saw that the UK can play a role in European security and that it is and still plays a role as a major security provider. It can act quickly, but um, if Brexit remains, they, it's not even an elephant in a room. It's an obvious obstacle to any kind of bilateral relations as well. And it poisons and complicates bilateral relations. And as long there is no normal modus operandi with um, the EU as, as an institution or as, as an organization, um, that will permanently slow down bilateral relations. They will exist, but um, that makes it much more complicated for European partners, and such as Germany, and that is what the UK needs to be aware of. Great, thank you all very, very much. I think this was uh, quite a wide ranging discussion. I'm sure we could continue debating these issues for, for a long, long time. There are so many aspects we, we couldn't quite cover. Um, but I think that's all we have we have time for. Um, thank you very much to the speakers, the panelists for your um, for your remarks, your starting remarks, and then your contributions to the discussion. I found it really, really stimulating and, and interesting. I was I was nodding quite a, quite a lot. I mean, there were some some areas where I would have liked to jump in and question uh, question uh, some of some of the arguments, but I think on the whole, it was really, really good discussion. And I hope this is not the, the last time we're uh, seeing each other either on the screen or, or in person. Thank you to the audience for your um, great questions, your comments. Um, I'm sorry if I haven't uh, been able to pick up on, on, on all of them. I've tried to summarize some of these, uh, these questions uh, and comments. And um, yeah, and thank you uh, very much to the, to the host of the Center for Grand Strategy for putting this on. Um, strategy is always is always ongoing, and uh, if there's one thing that is true, uh, is that Germany could do with more strategic thinking and uh, longer term thinking. That does have, I think, as Elena rightly said, short term implications, because there may be things that change in very dramatic ways that you can't recover uh, uh, if you lose that that window. So uh, I hope this is a useful contribution. Again, thank you very much. Um, this meeting um, is recorded, so it will be available uh, at a later stage. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's keep keep watching um, this space, and um, let's see where where the debate uh, in Germany, in Europe, and in the UK takes us. So thank you very much, and um, yeah, have a good evening.